So let's take a look at some of the factors affecting SN1 reactions. And the first one we'll look at is substrate effects. And it's, with an SN2 reaction, we learned that sterics was a big deal with backside attack. But with SN1 reactions, again, we're not doing backside attack. And again, it's all about the carbocation. We'll find that the trend's going to follow the same trend as carbocation stability. And you might recall from the last chapter that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, and secondary are more stable than primary, and primary carbocations are more stable than methyl carbocations. And so the more substituted carbocations, the more stable, and that's the trend in reactivity we see. We find that tertiary halides are the most reactive in SN1 reactions, and followed by secondary. And then generally, methyl and primary halides don't react in SN1 reactions. The carbocation would not be stable enough to form. The exception is if your carbocation ends up being resonant stabilized, either because you had an allylic halide or a benzylic halide. But outside of that, prim primary methyl carbocations generally uh, don't form and you definitely aren't doing an SN1 reaction with those uh, primary and methyl halides. So second here, we're going to look at some nucleophile effects. So and if you recall, the nucleophile is not even involved in the rate determining step for an SN1 reaction and therefore not going to show up in the rate law here. So you see the substrate shows up, but not the nucleophile. And so what we find for an SN1 reaction is that the nucleophile is not that important. Uh, and we like to say that weak nucleophiles are OK. So and that's in contrast to what we saw with SN2. For SN2 reaction, you have to have a strong nucleophile as it's involved in the rate determining step and shows up in the rate law. But for an SN1 reaction, a weak nucleophile is just fine. It's not even involved in the slow step, and it's not in the rate law. Now, technically, we could have a low concentration of a strong nucleophile still do SN1. It's not very common, but I'll, I'll cover my bases here. Uh, we could even have uh, a strong nucleophile doing SN1 like with a tertiary halide. So tertiary halides, you can't do backside attack on a tertiary halide, so you can't do SN2. So strong nucleophiles like to do SN2, but if it's a tertiary halide, you can't, it might still do SN1. So I'm not saying you're never going to ever, ever, ever see a, an SN1 reaction involving a strong nucleophile, but by and large, you're generally going to see a weak nucleophile doing SN1. And water and alcohols are by far the most common weak nucleophiles we will deal with. So now we're going to look at some solvent effects, and this is a big one. So it turns out for SN2 reactions, as you recall, we said that polar aprotic solvents are sometimes necessary, uh, and if they're not, they're still preferred. Uh, but for an SN1 reaction, it is absolutely essential that the solvent be polar protic, that it be capable of hydrogen bonding. And again, water and alcohols are going to be the most common solvents here as well. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a the ion dipole forces that result when water solvates a carbocation. So it turns out SN1 again is all about carbocation formation, and if the solvent's not protic, you're not going to form that carbocation. It won't be stable enough in an aprotic solvent to form typically. So your solvent has to, has to, has to be protic, and water and alcohol will be the most common. So if you recall, we just said that water and alcohols will be the most common nucleophiles, and now we're finding out they're also the most common solvents. Well, many SN1 reactions are what we call solvolysis reactions. A solvolysis reaction is a reaction where the solvent actually is involved in the reaction, is a, is a reactant in the reaction. And most of the SN1 reactions we'll study are going to be solvolysis reactions. In fact, every example I've already given in this section, uh, they've all been solvolysis reactions. So I might say, which of the following alkyl halides is most reactive in an SN1 reaction? And maybe I'll give you a primary halide, a secondary halide, and a tertiary halide, and you're supposed to know it's the tertiary. Uh, but maybe I just alter the question a little bit and I say, which of the following alkyl halides is most reactive in a solvolysis reaction. And you're supposed to realize that I'm still talking about an SN1 reaction when I use the word solvolysis in this chapter. Finally, we're going to talk about some leaving group effects here. So, and this is the one thing SN1 and SN2 have in common. They both have the same leaving group trend. Uh, and the reason is because the leaving group leaves in both reactions in the rate determining step. So in an SN1 reaction, the rate determining step is simply the leaving group leaving. Whereas in an SN2 reaction, you have nucleophilic attack and the leaving group leaving. Uh, but in both cases, the leaving group leaves in the rate determining step. And so they follow the same trend. Uh, and you need a better leaving group in both cases. And generally, the weaker the base, the better the leaving group, the faster the reaction. And as we said earlier, iodine is a better leaving group than bromide, and bromide's better than chloride. So as iodide is larger and a weaker base than bromide, and bromide's larger and a weaker base than chloride. Uh, and better than all three of them, again, is this sulfonate ester we alluded to earlier that, again, you might not see until the alcohol chapter. But again, the bigger the halogen leaving group, the better the halogen leaving group. Big take-home message here, and that's for both SN1 and SN2.